I've had this question since the start of Egghead, and I cannot get it out of my mind. And that is, uh, what is up with the outfits? Don't think I don't see what you're doing, Oda, okay? All of the guys' outfits are like these like giant cloaks that are covering everything up. Even Sanji and Jimbe, they're wearing different outfits, but they're still heavily covered. And let's not even talk about Frankie that like for the first time, I think is wearing pants. But do you want to explain the design philosophy behind uh, Nami and Robin and Bonnie? Don't think I don't see what you're doing because I'm making fun of you. <clears throat> Okay, now we can talk about less important matters, like anything else that happened in Egghead. So there's been a question that's been on my mind since we met Vegapunk, and it's something that I think these chapters have finally answered, and that is, where exactly does Vegapunk's morality lie? I've been thinking about it, like he's not against the Straw Hats per se, especially now needing their help, but just a lot of things that Vegapunk does are questionable, like Vegapunk has questionable ethics. I think there's this whole, there's like layers to this. The first issue is that Vegapunk isn't like one person anymore. Vegapunk is like a collection of people who all have these very different personalities. There's specifically like a clone that is like the bad clone and then there's like the good clone. And so Vegapunk, when originally creating all of these different clones, wanted to have the most variety in experiences. And that resulted in, again, some very questionable ethics. All of the different versions of Vegapunk have their own unique personalities, even if it's harmful to others. Because, at the end of the day, it creates more varied experiences. And so what we're learning from Vegapunk is that he is willing to create harmful or dangerous scenarios if he can gather data from it. When the baby version of Jimbei comes out and starts attacking the Straw Hats, Vegapunk lets baby Jimbei get in harm's way if it means gathering data. And that's besides the questionable ethics that went into creating child soldiers in the first place. And yet, not all of the versions of Vegapunk are ethically questionable, but that's the bigger issue. Like, Vegapunk at this point isn't one guy. He's a hive mind. A delayed hive mind. Which I, is, I think that's worse. Now, Vegapunk isn't on the Revolutionary Army side, but he is sympathetic towards their cause. He listens to what Dragon has to say. He understands what the Revolutionary Army is trying to do, but doesn't exactly agree with all of their methods and is instead leaning towards the world government, not for any ethical reasons, but more for their funding. The main version of Vegapunk, the Einstein version seems to have the philosophy that science will never advance if you worry. I think Vegapunk is ultimately a character that is more focused on scientific progress than the consequences that resulted from it, i.e. Uh, Bonnie and Kuma and the current backlash that he's facing because of that. While we're on Bonnie and Kuma, we got a lot of information about Kuma in these chapters, which I find interesting because it feels so wrong. Kuma was apparently known as this, like, bad and corrupt king before he was removed from the throne, but that would make him the only bad king in the entire story that starts off bad and then gets replaced by someone good. Literally every other ruler in the story was wrongfully removed. Kuma might have just been framed as a bad ruler by the world government, but we objectively know that he's not a bad guy. For one, Bonnie outright denies a lot of what is said about him. And yeah, sure, she's biased, but she's the only one who really seems to know anything about Kuma that isn't hearsay. And secondly, he's part of the Revolutionary Army. Even the worst Revolutionary Army member is still fighting a noble cause. Also, um, hi, edit. Um, just as I was editing this, I found this panel that says that Kuma was connected to a group of special people, which to me implies that he is connected to the Void Century. If he is directly connected as like one of the last remaining groups from the ancient civilization that got wiped out during the Void Century, I think that has very interesting implications and could explain why he has done so much of what he has done. Okay, uh, back to what Past Me was saying. Rather, similarly to Luffy and other pirates, I think we are seeing the world government dictate how everyone should view the world government's enemy. So everything that we are hearing is a distorted perspective. 
And so now a lot of questions start to churn. Like, did the world government brand him as evil? Did he in turn join the revolutionary army and then become a warlord because it would grant him protection from the world government? And did he strike a plan with Vegapunk, who we know isn't entirely with the world government and has some connections to the revolutionary army? Now to do what? Well, I, <laughs> well, I think that's kind of the big question, right? We saw that one of the things that he did and that he was programmed to do was save the Straw Hats from Sabaody because for as dangerous as Sabaody was, Kuma did end up sending them all to very strategically safe locations that ended up helping him. And when the crew all arrived back at Sabaody, who was there to protect the Thousand Sunny if not for the robot Kuma, which is weird. Because that's either A, an acceptance that Luffy is a good person, or B, a way to help Dragon. Again, you would presume that Luffy is a good person. I think one of the moves that Kumo was planning to do was to separate himself from Bonnie so that she doesn't get caught up in all of this. But maybe he also did this to get inside the world government. He is used there all the time. Maybe he is connected in some way to punk records. Maybe Vegapunk is waiting for the perfect time to set them all loose against the world government. Maybe there is one giant plan in motion and all we're really waiting for is the perfect time. And maybe that's why Kuma is currently moving around right now. This does introduce like a, like a weird question, which is that, um, why is there like no protocol in case Kuma runs into Bonnie? From the looks of it, there isn't. Like when Kuma saw Bonnie in Egghead, he started blasting, which is, which is insane. I would have thought that there would be at least some implemented uh, stand down for your daughter protocol or something, but, but nope, good luck. So can we talk about the Ohara incident? Throughout the story, we've been learning about this like advanced civilization that existed in the past. Ohara found out about this ancient kingdom and burned to the ground. What's interesting now is how we get so much context about the aftermath of it all. We found out that Vegapunk, New Clover, went to Ohara, like, with his own eyes, and met the Revolutionary Army there. How Vegapunk learned all that he could about the research of Ohara, because for him, similarly to Ohara, information was more knowledgeable than his own safety. It's very fitting to the story, through the themes of Inherited Will, that Vegapunk is carrying the will of Ohara and attempting to store the knowledge of the sea into a very metaphorical sea of knowledge that ideally would be shared with everyone. Now, I do have some questions about this section of the story. There's some things that I feel questionable about, but frankly, like, I didn't mind them too much. But they're weird to think about. Like how the world government didn't come back and absolutely destroy every single book Fahrenheit 451 style. I get that Ohara saved the books by tossing them into the river. That's something like pretty historically accurate. But I just assumed the world government, uh, you know, has gone to more extremes for less. Or how Saul is alive, which like I'm going back and forth on it even now. Like sure, he didn't technically die. He was like frozen in an ice age, but the story kind of implies that he should have died there. And I should feel upset about that, but I don't. I waited a couple of days just to like let this soak in. And uh, even now I'm going back and forth on it. So maybe I'll change my opinion on this later, but currently I'm not against it. I'll get upset later maybe. One of the biggest moments from these chapters that have been revealed is a giant, massive robot. We are told of an ancient lost civilization that was wiped off the map. And it makes me wonder if whoever helped make this giant, massive robot sometime in the ancient past also had the brain brain fruit. I think there are characters who are really smart and capable in the story who don't need it in order to create what feels already like very futuristic things. Frankie is an obvious example, so I wouldn't doubt that there is a possibility of creating something this advanced even without that fruit. But I think a question that has been created because of what we saw happen to Lelucia a few chapters ago is just how often something like this has happened. It makes me wonder if there's other civilizations who might have known too much or might have been close to some specific breakthrough similar to the ancient civilization might too have been snuffed out by the world government. That this isn't like a rare of a thing as we imagine. And so we're kind of being held back 
progress wise and anytime we get a little bit closer to that ceiling we get shot back down again anyways one of the fascinating things to me was that this ancient robot who was built around the time of the void century only recently attacked 200 years ago did the world government know about it beforehand and it only then attacked was it sent to the future we know of certain characters who are able to send things into the future but if so why so far? Why did it wait until 200 years ago to do it? But the thing is, I don't know any event that I can think of right now that happened 200 years ago. Like at best I can think of like the giants fighting, but that only goes back like 100 years. A closer event might have been like Skypea, but I think that also is too long ago. So if I'm missing an event that's like 200 years ago that we have mentioned before, I can't exactly remember it. Hi, so I've read a little bit more. I'm on chapter 1069 now. And um, in the last review, I said that it was kind of dumb that I thought we would learn anything at all about scientific progress and that we would clearly learn about Bonnie. Only for all of these chapters that I've read so far to be all about scientific progress in one way or another. In the fight against Lucci, Vegapunk confirms that Devil Fruits, if anything, are a manifestation of human desire. That they represent the dreams of individuals manifested into reality. That while beautiful, these manifestations of dreams are an insult to Mother Nature itself, and that is why users are punished by the sea. Or at least that's the theory of it all. Which I think is really beautiful and connects to a lot of the themes that we've talked about. Throughout all of these chapters, we've also been learning about Vegapunk's ultimate goal to create a boundless source of energy. He talks about an undying flame and creating our own sun, which are all signs of progress, sure, but also are very interesting words to use, as the sun has constantly been referenced throughout the entire story as a thing we look forward to and gives us hope. Now with the information that we got from these chapters, we're learning that the notion of finding an infinite source of energy, the very notion of acquiring a sun or getting to the dawn, is the very thing that the world government has been snipping out. Vegapunk right now is in trouble for trying to acquire the sun and back in the robot section, I talked about people or countries that have been snipped out if they find anything close to any historical answers or scientific advancements and it appears that is exactly what's happening. So during one section of Egghead, we cut away to Blackbeard. No context, Law just ran into Blackbeard and now they're fighting because he was waiting for one of them to leave Wano and arrive through this section and Law just so happened to be the guy. Now, in one of the cover pages, we got shown that Blackbeard, or I guess Kuzan, managed to capture Pudding, which is crazy. So Blackbeard has done a lot of the pre-planning. Big Mom is out of the running, so she doesn't need Pudding anymore. And if Blackbeard, or maybe even Law, can swoop in and get Pudding on their team, that is a big victory. As for the fight, I'm hoping that we'll eventually come back to this later in this arc, but it's really difficult to know for sure. We tend to see the start or the middle of a fight with Blackbeard, but we never get to see the full thing. What we do see though is fascinating. Law is shown to have been hit with Ivankov's ability, but Eva's not around, and I don't think Eva's dead, like I'm, I'm pretty sure. So I don't know what happened there. We see Blackbeard going head to head with Law, and even after getting absolutely destroyed by Law's ability, Blackbeard casually wants to run it back like he didn't get hurt. Because obviously, he must have felt that. I like that. That's a power move. So it's one of the more interesting fights. I'm interested to see what happens here, but again, uh, it's possible that we're just gonna cut away and that everything's gonna happen off screen. I hope it doesn't, but I'm not holding my breath for it. Now for the awkward bit, all right? Look, at the start of Egghead, we saw CP0, and I didn't talk about him because I'm kind of a hater. Okay, look, I watched all of the One Piece movies, and like CP0 appeared uh, three times, and all of those times, they did absolutely nothing. I was excited to see anything happen with them, and nothing did. When CP0 was brought back into this arc, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of potential paths that the story could have taken with him. At the start, we have Rob Lucci questioning Lelucia and his command, so clearly he's not fully on board with what he's doing. They're also commanded to get and kill Vegapunk. Again, something that he's not really fully on board with either. But also, 
that's a good thing. It shows that the story is maybe trying to go down a path that's not just, oh, a rematch because the world government said so. And it also kind of shows that Rob Lucci is sick of being a puppet. From a storytelling perspective, there's so much potential here, right? CP0 was the catalyst for the conclusion of the first half of the story. A lot of the story beats around in this lobby were about going onto an island to save someone from the world government because they knew something that the world government didn't want them to know. And what is Egghead if not a parallel to that story beat with Vegapunk? Not only is the same story be present here, but so is CP0, an antagonist of that arc. So I was like, I'm sure that we'll eventually get something, but I'm not going to talk about it until something finally happens. And it was only until chapter 1069 where CP0 finally started doing something. So let's talk about it. One of the things that I absolutely love about Vegapunk is that he's kind of portrayed as a goofy guy with all of his other versions being a little bit tougher, but CP0 calls him out for vanishing CP5, CP7, and CP8. So clearly they have been destroying every government ship that has tried to get them up until now. And so CP0 is kind of cautious and that's how they're able to escape. But imagine if Vegapunk just wiped them out. Points for trying! And we started to see them fight with Luffy, so I'm sure we're gonna get like a dozen or so chapters of that. But what interests me a lot about the fight between Luffy and Luchi are the clouds that surround the characters. So I've talked about the clouds before, they surround awakened users some of the time, it kinda depends. But in this most recent fight with Luffy versus Luchi, we see dark clouds, which I think is the first time, I'm pretty sure, that we've ever seen them. And that's weird. Now, I did think it was very poetic and relevant when the clouds appeared around Luffy and specifically his devil fruit, maybe even Zunisha, because it in some ways relates to Luffy. So having cloud spirals around these two uh, makes sense. But with Luchi and Dark Clouds, it, uh, it feels a little bit weird. I know we're at the end game and we're going to see a lot more characters with awakened abilities, but I really hope that not everyone gets clouds. Or if there is, I hope that there's an explanation for Dark Clouds and it's not just like, oh, they're awakened, but they're also evil or bad or something like that. Right now, I really like the idea that the Dark Clouds are kind of like a rejection of the fruit, kind of like if the ideals of uh, the dream and the person who is using the abilities don't quite line up, but that doesn't really feel like it's the case. Rob Lucci actually feels like he does fit the fruit and its intentions. So I'm just going to let him cook something up because this has been such a long running theme that I feel like there has to be way more to this. But I swear, if we get to the end of the arc and there isn't an explanation for this and everyone just has dark clouds from now on, I am going to make fun of this. For the next chapters, I'm hoping we finally see uh, Frankie and Vegapunk interact. That hasn't happened yet. It's messed up. He's a robot. Like he's been in Vegapunk's home and I feel like they should talk about that. I also want to see more of Law and Blackbeard, more of like Sabo and Emu, uh, more of Vivi. What happened to that? I think we're going to get a lot of info about Kuma and Bonnie, but we're not going to get a lot of info about the whole like special people thing. I think we'll get most of that stuff after Egghead and that's kind of what worries me because I really hope that we don't leave all of that to happen off screen. But who knows? 